Hello there, and welcome to another edition of Poetry, Prayer, and Piano, a weekly service coming to you from Second Presbyterian Church in Portsmouth, Ohio. My name is Allison Bauer, and I'm the pastor here at Second Pres, and planning the service with me is Dr. Stan Workman, our director of music. The format we're going to follow is this. We'll hear a snippet of a song chosen by Stan, explore the poem and prayer of the day, and then listen to the full version of the song. It is our hope that you will use this time to retreat from your day for just a little bit and to listen for God speaking to you through the words and the music. As part of the reconciling work of the Church of Jesus Christ, Stan and I share a belief in the importance of lifting up the works of black poets and composers. So that will be our theme for the next couple of weeks. It is our hope that God speaks to you during these videos and that you will take this opportunity to learn more about the names you hear mentioned in these poetry, prayer, and piano services. So let us pray. Today's poet is Claude McKay, born Festus Claudius McKay in 1889 in Jamaica. He was a central figure in the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, and one of the writers who influenced Langston Hughes, whom we studied a few weeks ago. McKay was not only a poet, but also a novelist a manuscript writer, a short story writer, and he even wrote two autobiographical books as well, A Long Way From Home in 1937 and My Green Hills of Jamaica, posthumously published in 1979. Claude was the youngest of seven siblings, born to well-to-do farmers who had enough property to qualify to vote. His parents were active and well-respected Baptists. His father was a strict religious man who struggled to develop close relationships with his children because of his serious nature. But in contrast, his mother, Hannah, had a warmth that allowed her to give love freely to all of her children. Educated primarily by his older brother, Uriah Theodore, Claude became an avid reader of classical and British literature, philosophy, science, and theology, with a large side order of William Shakespeare. As a teenager, he met a neighbor, Walter Jekyll, who became a mentor and inspiration for him, encouraging Claude to write in his native Jamaican dialects, and he even set some of Claude's verses to music. He also helped him to publish his first book of poems, Songs of Jamaica. In his younger days, McKay was attracted to communism, yet later in life asserted he never actually joined the Communist Party in the USA. He was also for a time active in a group of black radicals who fought for black self-determination within the context of socialist revolution. But when the Justice Department began to turn the heat up on the group, McKay left the country, traveling to London, England, where his commitment to socialism deepened and his reading turned to that of Karl Marx. After London, he traveled to Russia in 1922 to take part in the Fourth Congress of the Communist International in Petrograd and Moscow. He was greeted there with an ecstatic welcome and rock star treatment. A few years later, he visited again, and he was so well known in Russia that the brother of Nicholas II let him stay at his palace. People from all walks of life in Russia knew or had heard of him, 
and they all wondered what it was like for a black person in America. For his part, he noticed that life in Russia was very similar to the life of a black man in the United States. That people who were of a certain faith or religion were not given the same rights and opportunities as other people. Perhaps this was when the seeds of discontent were sown in his heart. Because later in his life, McKay grew so disenfranchised with communism that he walked away from it completely. Instead, he turned to religion, converting to Roman Catholicism instead. But before doing so, he wrote to his longtime friend and mentor, Max Eastman, and he wrote about, quote, doing a lot of reading and research especially on Catholic work among Negroes. Because if and when I take the step, I want to be intellectually honest and sincere about it. Five months later, he was baptized into the Roman Catholic Church, writing again to Eastman, I am not less the fighter for doing so. While McKay's name is maybe not one of the ones we think of first when we think of the Harlem Renaissance, he has been recognized for his intense commitment to expressing the challenges faced by black Americans. And he is admired for devoting his art and his life to social protest. So dedicated was he that his poem, If We Must Die, was recited in the film August 28th, a Day in the Life of a People, which debuted at the opening of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016. I have some comments about the poem, but let me read the poem first. It's called To the White Fiends, and Claude McKay writes this. Think you I am not a fiend and savage too? Think you I could not arm me with a gun and shoot down ten of you for every one of my black brothers murdered, burnt by you? Be not deceived, for every deed you do I could match, outmatch. Am I not Africa's son, black of that black land where black deeds are done? But the Almighty from the darkness drew my soul and said, Even thou shalt be a light, a while to burn on the benighted earth. Thy dusky face I set among the white, for thee to prove thyself of highest worth. Before, before the world is swallowed up in night, to show thy little lamp, go forth. Go forth. You may not notice it as I read it, but McKay often wrote in the sonnet form, like he does here in this poem, To the White Fiends. A sonnet is a poem of 14 lines, which this has 14 lines, with 10 syllables in each line. And this poem has 10 syllables in each line. Sonnets, you may know, were Shakespeare's bread and butter. But while Shakespeare writes something like, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? McKay uses the sonnet to write about the tensions between blacks and whites in the 1920s. In perfect poetic form, he writes of the way white fiends hunt down, torture, and kill people with black or brown skin like him, as you can read about in his poem called The Lynching. In today's sonnet, he sounds angry at the beginning, with rage that is about to boil over, speaking perhaps of the possibility for revenge, of him taking revenge, of taking an eye for an eye in return for the loss of countless black lives at the hands of white beans. He himself is capable of the violence of revenge, he seems to say. Think you I am not a fiend and savage too? 
Think you I could not arm me with a gun and shoot down ten of you for every one of my black brothers murdered, burnt by you? And just when it feels like rage might be about to boil over, enter the Almighty, who withdraws his soul from the darkness and makes him a light. A dusky face set among the white, for thee to prove thyself of highest worth, before the world is swallowed up in night, to show thy little lamp, go forth, go forth. I will admit that as I was looking for a poem to talk about this week, I didn't really want to pick this one or engage with this one. And I thought to myself, after all, I'm not a white fiend. I'm not the person Claude McKay is writing about. I don't have anything to do with this poem. And then I remembered the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran pastor who was executed in a Nazi concentration camp for speaking out against Adolf Hitler. He said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And I remembered that that was why Stan and I had decided to do this series of Pope services about black artists and composers because there is a perspective in this world that people need to hear. Evil in this world that needs to be faced. And so these are poems worth studying and worth lifting up. A hundred years after Claude McKay wrote this poem, there are still white fiends in our world. And there is still a burning desire for justice and equality that comes awfully close to a desire for revenge, particularly for those who trace their roots back to Africa instead of Europe. So there is still a need to speak up in the face of evil itself, certainly for our brothers and sisters with brown and black skin, but also for ourselves. For God will not hold us guiltless in our silence. After that rather heavy poem, the prayer part of this poetry, prayer, and piano service, we return to the complete book of Christian prayer, one of my favorite books in the whole world, judging from the number of post-it notes sticking out from its pages. It's written by Kathy Galloway from the Iona community, an ecumenical Christian community of men and women begun by a minister in the Church of Scotland but a community which has been extended into all flavors of Christianity, among them Presbyterians, Anglicans, Lutherans, Quakers, Roman Catholics, and those with no denominational allegiance. And it picks up on the themes of longing for justice and equality, which is so integral to Claude McKay's voice and writing and perspective. So let us pray. O oh, my heart's heart, in love and anger, I will turn to you. For my soul cries out, where is justice? When will the balance be redressed? For the fearful dreams of children who sleep with knives, for the beaten women and the shamed and helpless men. 
Where is justice? For the agony of hunger is not to be set against the insatiable appetites of jaded palates. In the villages and camps, the children lie bleeding, and the great wounds gape in their throats and sides. In the city, there is no safety for them. As the leaves blow through the night streets, they are swept away. They disappear without a trace, as if they had never been. In the marketplace, weapons are bought and sold. They change hands as easily as onions from a market woman. And killing comes lightly everywhere. The value of people is weighed out on crooked scales and found wanting. They are discarded like bruised apples because they lack the appearance of perfection. But you, my heart's heart, you are careful like a thrifty housewife who sees no waste in anything. You gather up that which has been cast aside, knowing its sweetness, and take it home with you. And I will see you in the camps and villages, working late into the night, showing patience in the midst of confusion, reweaving the web of life. I will see you in the cities, seated in a circle, making new plans, drawing attention, naming the forgotten names. I will see you in the marketplace, dressed in black, with the carved face of an old woman saying no to war. And you will stand your ground, and you will seem beautiful to me. For you are my sanctuary and my light, my firm ground when the earth cracks under the weight of warring gods. As a woman in mortal danger flees to her sisters and finds refuge, so you will comfort me and dress my wounds with tenderness. And when the flame of courage burns low in me, your breath as gentle as a sleeping child, will stir the ashes of my heart. Teach me to know your judgment as my friend, that I may never be ashamed of justice, or so proud that I flee from mercy. For your love is never less than justice, and your strength is tenderness. You contain my soul's yearning, and in your encompassing embrace, I am free.
Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.